Laura Flynn, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. Okay, there it is. Sorry, my video is blocked. Um, uh, my name is Laura Flynn. I want to welcome you all on behalf of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. We've organized this webinar today to tell the story of UNIFA, the medical and uh, university in Haiti, and to raise funds for a brand new teaching hospital in Haiti. The Haiti Emergency Relief Fund was founded in the aftermath of the 2004 coup in Haiti to provide direct support to grassroots organizations and institutions fighting for justice and democracy in Haiti. Um, Nearly 30 years ago, I helped to found the Haiti Action Committee in the Bay Area, which is a sister organization to HERF. Um, I did that with Pierre Labossier and Robert Roth, who are both still in this struggle with me, and a whole bunch of other folks. It was a particularly dire moment in Haiti's history, and we felt compelled to act here in the United States, both politically and to provide material support um, in solidarity with people's movement in Haiti. I want to thank the board of HERF, co-chairs Walter Riley, Sister Maureen Dugman, co-chairs Pierre Lebossier, Nina Amara, Marilyn Langlois, Robert Roth, and Seth Donnelly for organizing this call and inviting me to share the Zoom stage today with a really incredible lineup of speakers. Um, I'm thrilled to be doing this. UNIFA is one of my favorite places on earth, and as you will hear, it's basically a miracle. Um, we have over 60 organizations co-sponsoring the event with us. Um, so it's been an incredible outpouring of support for Haiti and for this, this incredible hospital. The call will be 90 minutes long. In just a couple minutes, we're going to be hearing from Danny Glover, 
Um, and then uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, if she's able to jump on with us. She's in the midst of major negotiations in Washington, but she has agreed to, to spend a couple minutes with us. So we're really honored to have her. And then we're gonna hear from Mildred Aristide, who will be joining, who is joining us from Haiti. And after that, we're gonna hear from Dr. Henri Ford, who is a, uh, a doctor, a Haitian American doctor here in the United States, who spent a lot of time in Haiti, um, civil rights lawyer, Ira Kurzban, and Karana Harmon, president of the Black Student Union at Foothills College, who just recently returned from leading a youth delegation to Haiti. A um, Couple of technical things, we're broadcasting via Zoom, as well as Facebook Live and Twitter. If you're on the Zoom call, we encourage you to join from your computer rather than the phone because it's a better experience. And we'll be sharing some short videos so you'll better be able to see that. Um, it's also not too late to share out uh, the Facebook Live or Twitter links if you're on there with friends who, 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 can, who can join us today. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we plan to use it over the next couple of months to continue to tell Unifa's story and to share it with all of you to, to share with others who maybe weren't able to make the call today. So we are in an incredible moment, both in the United States, in the world, and in Haiti. And it feels really um, just like all of these things are coming together in a really major way. I, I lived in Haiti in the late 90s, um, worked really closely with Mildred and with President Aristide at the Aristide Foundation for Democracy for five years. And UNIFA was really born at that time. It was an idea to provide more medical, uh, to provide education to people who had never had access to higher education, to really, um, the vast majority of people in Haiti are poor and had no access to any kind of um, advanced education and a desperate need for medical care. Um, Mildred's gonna talk a lot more about the founding and how that all happened, but I just wanted to say that this has been a long, a long story that many of us on this call have been involved with for decades of our lives. Um, and it's very cool to have everybody here on this call together today. Um, I actually live in Minneapolis now. Uh, and so um, I live about 12 blocks from where George Floyd was murdered in uh, May. And some of the things that I've seen and witnessed in Minneapolis took me directly back to my experiences in Haiti for better and for worse, including seeing National Guard um, trucks and military patrolling down my street, um, things that I had only seen before in Haiti. And at, but at the same time, this incredible movement emerging with power and vision and youth voices that also deeply remind me of Haiti. And I feel that um, Haitians have taught the world how to resist, how to protest, and how to continue resisting over a very, very long time against all odds. Um, so I am always inspired by the movements in Haiti, and I know they're deeply connected to the movements in our own country. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Danny Glover. Um, who doesn't need a huge introduction. I think we all know he is an actor and activist who's visited Haiti numerous times and he's been a steadfast supporter of the work of UNIFA for many years. Um, he's probably better known for many other roles, but I know my favorite role was when he uh, participated in a reenactment of the Haitian, a theatrical reenactment of the Haitian Revolution at the, national, at the Haitian National Palace on the bicentennial of the revolution in 2004. So let me welcome Danny. And uh, th 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 thank you so much, Laura. Uh, and thank you for all of all those who are joining us here for this very special moment. I mean, any, any moment, at any time I get to celebrate Haiti, but most notably the Haitian people, it's one of the great honors for me and one of the great privileges for me. And I say that with privilege in so many ways, as I remember back the period, my whole life with, with, with Haiti. And most times that people refer to me, if they ask me whether I'm Haitian, and I've always used Frederick Douglass's uh, great statement that he's a Haitian at heart, that I'm a Haitian at heart, and always will be. Um, when I, I think about the heroic struggles of the Haitian people, it, it, it is the most extraordinary poem moment in human history of everything that's happened in Haiti, it's translated in such a way that it's, it's been transformative for all of us. The real meaning 
at that very key moment, the real meaning for all men of created equal was created in Haiti in 1804. And we must never forget that. The first time I came to Haiti is about uh, two years out of college in 1973. And I just wanted to go there. I had read uh, certainly the great uh, C.L.R. James's, the Black Jacobins. And so it, it was itself a kind of calling if, if that, as if I had this calling to go to Haiti, but never would I would have been in my most amazing, in my most wildest dream as a young, uh, as a young man out, out of, out of finish, finishing college, never would I anticipate that I've had the privilege of having the relationship that I've had with Haiti over the last uh, nearly 30 years, over the last 30 years. And, and certainly, and there's so many faces that we talk about in so many ways in which we talk about the, the struggles that we've encountered in Haiti from the moment that my brother, my little brother, President Aristide was, was, was elected. From that moment, from, from the coup, Randall Robinson and the great, the hunger strike that he went on in order to have, have the, re, the democracy come back to Haiti and the reestablishment of, of, uh, of our, our friend and our president, President Zara Steve. All those were the things that just a, a template of the, the opportunities that I have to engage with, with the Haitian people, uh, whether it was at the bicentennial and an extraordinary bicentennial, imagine the 200 years old in, uh, in, 19, in 2004. All those things have been important to me and certainly I've talked about Haiti through my desire, which continues to be my um, desire uh, to make a movie on that in the, about that great moment in Haitian history, but in world history, the transformative moment that happened in world history. In fact, my 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 company that does extraordinary extraordinary work, um, film company called Louverture Films, know, know that. In, in homage to and respect to uh, the, 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 the great liberator and all, and all those people. And how it singularly every day, as you say that, Laura, as you say that they teach us about resistance. I don't care where they are in the world. If you, if you, are, if you talk to labor unions, and, uh, organized labor, and you talk about who some of the most ex explicit and most extraordinary organizers in the union, often you find that they're, they're Haitians. And, that, and in, their, in that sense, because why wouldn't they be? They organized a revolution that was successful in the revolution, the most successful revolution, I would say. And, 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 um, and the first victory, the first victory of Africans against the worldwide institution of slavery, the first victory there. And so you have to be that. And, I don't, and, and the, the role that they play historically, whether it's Simone Boulevard coming to Andre Pichon, you know, and, and beginning to come uh, uh, and, and receive resources in order to liberate South America. You know, so all these histories uh, that, that come into that we don't know, we're experiencing something in this, in this moment in our own country and in the world and particularly about this country. As Baldwin said, when we cannot tell the truth about our past, we become trapped in it. We're trapped in our, our past, whether it comes to our understanding of who the Haitian people represent, what they represent, not singly just to that island, but what they may represent to the world and, and represent to the hemisphere itself. So to the work that we need to do continues every moment that every moment that Haitian people on the island resist the oppression that they are un that underscores their history, every t every moment it's a challenge for us to meet with them and whatever and whatever they do. The Haitian Re Emergency Relief Fund is one as one as uh, uh, one part of that. The extraordinary idea of building a hospital to service the Haitian people is another. It's grassroots. It's from the it's from the bottom of our hearts and from the bottom of the Haitian people as well. So it's a privilege privilege for me to be at this particular moment on this phone call as we as we continue continue as as we would say often in Portuguese, 
a loot to continue. The struggle continues. Thanks so much, Danny. That was amazing. Um, we are so honored to have Congresswoman Maxine Waters with us today. Um, I saw her there. Um, Congressman Waters, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Um, Congressman Waters is serving her 15th term in Congress from the 43rd District of California. She made history as the first woman and first African American chair of the House Financial Services Committee. She's been an utterly fearless advocate for women, children, people of color, and the poor. She has been the foremost voice in Congress for democracy and human rights in Haiti. And those of us close to Haiti and to, and to the Aristides know just how deep a personal debt uh, that Haiti owes to Maxine. So without further ado, we turn it over to you, Congresswoman Waters. Um, our question is, we know you've been, oh, I'll just let you go. Okay. Well, thank you so very, very much. Uh, I was excited when I got the invitation to participate today for so many reasons. Uh, you know, this webinar gives me the opportunity uh, to reconnect with a number of people. Uh, but first, let me say uh, that I am just so proud of Mildred Aristide. I'm so proud of her for the work that she has done for so long. And this very, very special effort that she has made to do what perhaps many folks thought could not be done. Uh, she, uh, you know, is establishing uh, this teaching hospital and it's amazing uh, the work that she's done to get it started, to get it going. As a matter of fact, when this teaching hospital is completed, she will have and the island will have and Haiti will have, the people will have, trained physicians and others who work in that hospital setting because of the efforts that she has made the Aristide Foundation in training and developing uh, doctors and lawyers and nurses and so many other professions that they have developed uh, in the teaching and training overall that they have done under this foundation. So first I'd like to say hello to Mildred Aristide, former First Lady of Haiti. And of course, I always send my regards to President Aristide. Now, taking a look at all of the participants today, Danny Glover, I told Danny the last time I saw him, he's everywhere. I don't know how he manages his time, uh, but he does a remarkable job of being where he needs to be. Good to see you, Danny. Uh, also, I'm, I'm very, very pleased about all of the others who are on today, but our curse band is a special man. I want you to know I've been thinking about you, Ara. Um, I have not seen you for a long time, uh, but I know that you're doing the work that you've always done. Civil rights and immigration attorney who spent decades, as is indicated here, fighting for the rights of immigrants and refugees. And I, you and I have been together on some extraordinary journeys. And um, the most uh, interesting one was when we were put off the plane together uh, <laughs> uh, in Haiti. And uh, I've never forgotten uh, that incident, but you are such a brave soul who have been here on behalf of Haiti, on behalf of the Aristides, on behalf of doing everything that you possibly could do uh, to try and bring um, you know, the democracy to Haiti that it needs and it deserves. And so here we are. And on my recent visit, uh, the last visit uh, that I was on, uh, I think it was uh, maybe late last year, I had the opportunity not only to go to a great uh, meeting that was put together uh, at the university, but I also had the opportunity to view the plans of the teaching hospital and to go on the site and to walk through uh, with uh, Mildred uh, exactly what was being built, how it was being laid out, and already uh, much of the groundwork had been done at that time. And so I know that this not only is a tremendous effort 
but a very worthwhile effort, but it's going to need resources. It's going to need all of us to do everything that we can to ensure that this teaching hospital is completed, uh, that it has all of the equipment that it needs, that it is a place where all of these trained people, Haitians, all of these trained Haitians, trained by the university can go to work and can do uh, what they have been taught and what they have learned to do and to have the kind of careers that a lot of folks never anticipated. And so I'm delighted to be with you all today and for Laura Flynn and Henry Ford MD, MHA, and for Karanda Harmon, uh, I'm delighted to have joined you here today. Uh, with Danny Glover and my friend Ira Kurtzberg uh, to talk about what can be done uh, with this Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. I know that, you know, as we watch what is going on in Haiti, uh, we are pained uh, and we just believe that we have to continue the struggle uh, for freedom and for justice and for democracy. Uh, and perhaps, you know, um, We'll have a little bit of time for someone to start the conversation relative to that. But today, this is about UNIFA, the University of the Dr. Aristide Foundation. This is organized by the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. And so we've got to concentrate on what we can do uh, to be of support in the best way that we possibly can uh, to this fund so that this teaching hospital can become everything uh, that Mildred Aristide and the foundation have envisioned. This is a vision uh, that was started uh, with the Aristides and with the foundation. This is a vision that has become a reality. And so here I am and I wish I could do a lot more. I wish I could get to Haiti a lot more often. We need to be there. Uh, we need to be dealing with what is going on right now uh, with this uh, president. We need to understand what is happening to so many good people who have been uh, beaten and, you know, houses burned, all of that. But let me just uh, continue uh, in the way that I believe uh, that Mildred would like us to continue today. And let's focus on uh, UNIFA and let's focus on the mission uh, that we're, we're here to support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm just going to be here with you as I listen to everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, so great to have you with us today. Um, so we're now going to turn to a quick video that was made, put together in 2017. We wanted to give you some images so you can actually see the campus, see what it looks like for students. Um, the over 1,000 students who are now studying at the UNIFA campus. Um, so, Karina, if you can pull that up. Um, great. Give it one more minute, see if we can pull up that video. Haiti is usually depicted in a negative light. When you hear Haiti, you think of disaster. However, there is another story, one that you don't see or hear. UNIFA, the University of the Aristide Foundation, is working towards creating a new narrative about Haiti, training Haitian professionals to solve Haitian problems in Haiti. Doctors and nurses to treat and prevent cholera, engineers to build buildings that withstand earthquakes and floods, lawyers to champion the rights of Haiti's poor majority. UNIFA, a fully accredited, multidiscipline university staffed by Haitian professors, offers degrees in medicine, nursing, law, physical therapy, engineering, 
and dentistry, as well as a continuing education department. It has more than 1,300 matriculated students at its campus in Tabar, Haiti. President Jean-Bertrand Aristide returned to Haiti in 2011, determined to reopen UNIFA, to carry out his vision of providing a human rights-based model of education as the building block for effective change. UNIFA provides a safe environment for critical thinking, where young people gain the skills and knowledge to lead their country forward. UNIFA is unique in its commitment to break down social, economic, and gender barriers to higher education. Students receive a superior education for less tuition than other local private universities. A certain number of scholarships are granted to high school students with top grades throughout Haiti and provides a dormitory for students living in the outskirts. More than half of the students are young women. Matriculated students are encouraged to put their new knowledge at the service of poor communities. In fall of 2017, UNIFA's law school is launching a civic education program in the community to teach about rule of law and citizens' rights. Medical, nursing, and physical therapy students volunteer on a regular basis, assisting doctors and nurses at the Aristide Foundation's mobile clinic, serving thousands of local families. This year, we invite you to invest in a new narrative about Haiti. Please make your tax-deductible donation today. Your donation, in any amount, is important to UNIFA and greatly appreciated. Great. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, thanks, Corina, for pulling that up. And thanks to Michelle Carson, who actually helped put together that video for us. Um, Right now, I'm going to turn it over to Mildred Trio Aristide, the former First Lady of Haiti. She is an attorney, author, and member of the Board of Administration of the Université de la Fondation Aristide, UNIFA. Um, she's also one of my oldest friends. We've been working together for over 30 years. She is an absolute um, model of resilience, I would say. She has had to um, pick her life back up and put it together so many times. It's, it's astounding. And when we say that she's deeply involved with UNIFA, um, yes, she's, she's leading on the vision and she's helping raise the funds and she's talking to the people building, but she's also there every day and um, is the person who knows where all the keys are and has to worry about when the electricity goes out and all of the massive problems that come with administrating a major institution in Haiti. So she is both on the ground making it happen and also reaching out beyond Haiti to build the support for this visionary university. And I'm going to turn, she's going to tell us a whole lot more about the history and, um, and then the dream for uh, building this uh, teaching hospital on the campus at UNIFA. Welcome, Mildred. Thank you very much, Laura, for that uh, really kind introduction. Danny, Congresswoman Waters, thank you for your powerful testimonies. And it is wonderful to to be with you, even though we're not all together, but it just feels so, so right and so together. I hope that everyone um, who is attending and on this Zoom call is keeping safe and well. And I thank you for carving out this moment during these troubling times to have this conversation about our project for a teaching hospital at our university, UNIFA, here in Haiti. I know that your energy and your minds are rightfully occupied by the COVID-19 pandemic, the police murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. This struggle for racial equality um, in the United States is shining a light, not only of, on injustice in the US, but really throughout the world. And under these circumstances, I am most respectful of your commitment to engage with us today on our project to spend, and to spend this time together. 
a UNIFA teaching hospital is really a charge statement. And so it may not be the first thing you think about when you think of Haiti's multitude of needs. So why a teaching hospital and why now? The project demands interrogation. And it has to be seen against the, drop, the backdrop of the times that we're living in, that the world is living in. Because we're in the summer of 2020, of course, I will um, speak to the impact of, our, of COVID-19 on our project. If we were in January of 2010, I would speak to the impact of the earthquake that killed over 300,000 people. If it were 2012, we would talk about the impact of cholera outbreak right after the earthquake that killed over 10,000 people. If it were 2014, the chikungunya and the Zika viruses that infected probably half of our population. If it was 2015, our conversation would probably also center on the deadly hurricanes that hit the country that year. The connective tissue of all of these events is that they laid bare the absence of any real public health care system in Haiti. This was most evident in the, to the world after the earthquake, when medical missions from everywhere rushed to bring emergency and life-saving ca uh, life care to Haiti. These catastrophes also underscored the persistence of diseases that are directly linked to hunger, poverty, environmental degradation, repression, and violence in Haiti. And they amplify the urgency to train skilled healthcare workers to meet the healthcare needs of our population. Training that must take place in large part at a university teaching hospital. Each word, UNIFA, teaching, hospital, Haiti, requires some breaking down. And I'd like to start with Haiti. And I know that Danny and Laura gave a good setup as to the history of Haiti. And we who have, are involved with Haiti, know Haiti, always have to go to the history because it is so important to the present. My goal today is to show you that a teaching hospital in Haiti, no matter how far away Haiti may sound from where you are sitting right now this afternoon, but it intersects with the global struggle across the world that is converging into really one struggle for human dignity. Healthcare is a basic human right, but one that has long not been available to most Haitians. The same is true for education. We are trying to forge a pathway towards training a greater number of healthcare professionals precisely because it addresses both needs, health and education. And as Congresswoman Water says, at the same time, we are training citizens to be humanly connected to one another and increasing the number of skilled and active citizens able to affect change. We believe strongly that the teaching hospital is an important space where this can happen. Since Haiti's emergence, we have always stood at the crossroads of a struggle for dignity. And here I'll go to my brief, brief uh, examples from our history because they really are important to what we're experiencing today. Of course, in history, the most basic of our struggles was the struggle for our humanity. As Danny said, in 1804, an army of former slaves abolished slavery. It was the first country to ever do that. But in our backyard loomed heavy the presence of a giant slave nation, the United States. And all around us, encircling us in the Caribbean Sea, the slave colonies of Europe's great powers, France, England, and Spain. So we were boycotted and isolated. In 1825, on the threat of re-enslavement, Haiti was forced to pay a blood debt to France. Former slaves paid reparations to former slave masters. The amount represented France's annual budget and 10 years of revenue for Haiti. And by the time these debts ended, well into the 20th century, the debt had crossed the ocean, moving from France to an American bank. Then in a 19-year US occupation that started in 1915 and gave rise to a murderous Haitian army, responsible for repression and political instability for much of our history. For decades, the leadership of that army was trained at a US army named after a US Confederate general, Fort Benning in Georgia. And up until the waning days of the 35 year Duvalier dictatorship, both Duvalier father and son were supported with financial assistance and military assistance by the international community. These are just some of the things and some of the ways that show that Haiti has never lived separately from the political and economic realities of world affairs. These events 
crippled our nation's development. Persistent racism, social and economic exclusion, political corruption and instability layered on top of those events are the challenges that prevent Haiti from being whole. And it persists. From October to early December of last year, before the coronavirus had triggered the worldwide lockdown, the virus of poverty, repression, and hunger had triggered a national lockdown here in Haiti. We called it Pei Lock, country locked. Schools, banks, government offices, everything was closed. Neighborhoods and roads were barricaded. People demanding their human dignity. Haitians collectively asking to breathe. Now, I want to focus a little bit on UNIFA. The video spoke to the origins of, of UNIFA, and I'll just add a little bit more. Then I'll narrow in specifically on what medical education looks like at UNIFA and why the teaching hospital is vital. UNIFA was founded by my husband, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide, in 2001 during his second term as president. At the time, the country had a very robust um, medical training program with Cuba. So each year, up to 50 to 60 Haitian university students were enrolled in Cuban medical schools. In the 15 plus history of this program, over 700 Haitian doctors have been trained. We took it one step further in creating UNIFA, a medical school with a teaching staff that was composed of professors from Cuba, Cuba but situated here in Haiti. At the time, we had three goals, and those three goals continue to guide us to prepare doctors to also care for the poorest of the poor with a more humanistic approach, to increase the number of doctors practicing in the rural areas where there is almost an absence of any kind of care, and to break down the long tradition of exclusion of the poor majority in Haiti from access to higher education. Our vision was to create this safe learning environment so that young Haitians could begin and continue to think critically about our country, an institution to address our national issues, Haitians to train Haitian problems, as, le as we like to say. By the end of our first two years in the fall of 2003, there were approximately 240 students enrolled in our medical school. Now, for those of you who may be familiar with Haitian politics, you may know that shortly after the fall of 2003, specifically February 2004, there was a coup d'etat against President Aristide's government. It was the 32nd coup in the country's history. It came just months after President Aristide announced that it was time to open discussions with France on restitution and reparations for the debt extorted from Haiti in 1825. A Haitian government commission of economists estimated the present day value of the debt at over $21 billion. I can tell you that the request for dialogue did not go very over very well and it was not very well received. Within days after the 2004 coup, the international military force that had arrived in Haiti forced the, 20, the 240 students off campus and UNIFA transformed from university to military installation. Meanwhile, my daughters, my two daughters, my husband and I spent seven years in exile in South Africa. When we were able to return in 2011, in March of 2011, with great assistance from Maxine Water and Danny Glover, who was with us on that flight, Ira, we immediately set about to reopen UNIFA. We had to. And so in October of that first year, 2011, we reopened UNIFA. And again, we started with the medical school with, the same, with some of the same professors from uh, Cuba who had been there in 2004. And most importantly, the 240 UNIFA students who somehow continued their education in Cuba and were back in Haiti. Not all of them, but many of them. And of course, with much assistance from HERF and the Haitian Action Committee, we were able to clean up the campus and begin 126 students back in 2011. Nine years later, later, we've added six more schools. Today, our teaching staff is 100% Haitian. There are still some of the Cubans who are with us, but we're mostly a Haitian staff. In the area of health sciences, in addition to medicine, we've added nursing, dentistry, and physical therapy. In fact, our School of Physical Therapy 
is the first university level PT program in Haiti. As you can well imagine, a vitally needed service since the 2010 earthquake, which left tens of thousands of people injured and in need of therapy. We also have the law school, a school of engineering, architecture, and a school of administration. And this year we added a school of agriculture. Enrollment currently stands at approximately 2,002 students. A drop in the bucket when you consider the education needs in Haiti. An average Haitian who is 25 years or older has less than five years of schooling and about 50% of children don't attend school. Every year, approximately 40 to 45,000 students complete high school and pass the state mandated exam. And they are theoretically uh, eligible for entry into the university system. But there are not nearly enough university seats available to, to meet this need. Historically, those who can have gone to the United States, the Dominican Republic, Canada, or France um, for their university studies. But economically, that is becoming less and less of an option. And it's clearly not the solution for Haiti. Today, the hardships in Haiti are forcing our young people, skilled workers, construction workers, electricians, to flee to go to places as far as Panama, Brazil, and Chile. The dream of a visa cannot fuel the future of our country. Since we reopened in 2011, we have maintained our tuition lower than all the comparable universities in order to keep UNIFA accessible to as many Haitians as possible. We have a large campus in the country. It's the largest campus in the country, and it's situated about four miles from the airport, for those of you who may know Haiti. And we are in Tabar, which is a municipality that experienced a surge in the population following the 2010 earthquake. The academic buildings sit on 33 acres, and there is a sports field, a residential campus that is progressively growing to accommodate more students and professors. Right now, we have about 70 residents on the campus. Across the seven schools, we have 109 professors, and we welcome visiting professors from the United States and abroad. For instance, just last year, um, Dr. Douglas Gross from the California School, Davis School of Medicine, led a five-day neuro neuroanatomy seminar for our third-year students, which we opened up to other medical students. Interestingly, Dr. Gross first came to Haiti on one of those medical missions who came in after the earthquake. And after two years of coming back to provide clinical assistance, he realized that his skills as a professor would be better spent in the fields of medical education. And so he's committed to coming and, and coming back and teaching at UNIFA. And of course, we highly, we, we prize our Haitian diaspora and, and encourage them also to continue to be engaged as instructors at UNIFA. We are proud that in the last nine years since we reopened, we have graduated three classes in medicine, nursing, and law, and two classes in physical therapy. In total, we've added to the population 378 doctors, 97 nurses, 26 physical therapists, and 51 lawyers. A growing cohort of young professionals with a tool to enter the workforce in Haiti. Young professionals who have already demonstrated a commitment to be active participants of change in Haiti. Just this past week, I was at a nearby hospital with my father when I was approached by a young man who announced that he was a proud graduate of UNIFA, now working at the hospital. So, so those, those moments always make us feel very, very proud and very, very, um, very clear that we have to continue on this path. Now, I'd like to focus a little bit on the training that our students in the health sciences receive. Students in medicine, nursing, uh, dentistry, and physical therapy must, of course, have clinical training as part of their training. Right now, to meet this requirement, we are forced to parcel out our students to over 10 facilities across Haiti. Because of that, UNIFA does not have 100% control over this important part of their education. The institutions receiving our students charge a significant monthly fee, plus we have to pay the hospital staff doctors who oversee the training. After their fifth year of classroom instruction, medical students are required to complete a one-year internship. This year, we had 136 interns. And then after the internship, they must fulfill what is called a year of social service, 
which is traditionally the placement in a medical facility or a public health facility, usually outside the capital where access to health is most limited. And then when they finish that year of social service, for those who are lucky, there, is a, there are a very, very few number of residency seats where students can go on to specialize in a particular area of medicine. Because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, clinical training of our non-intern students had to be suspended. For our interns, the experience was mixed. They were assigned to three different state hospitals, but not all of the facilities were fully functioning. And in order for our students to work, we had to provide them with about $10,000 worth of protective equipment, in addition to having to pay the monthly fees and the doctor's fees that are required. In 2017, UNIFA decided to open a small clinic at our foundation's community center, which is not far from the university. We hired two dentists, installed two fully equipped dental chairs, hired an internist, a nurse, and an ophthalmologist. And steadily, over the past three years, we have invested to increase the range of services and the number of physicians. We added a pharmacy, a laboratory, and a small outpatient surgery unit. We now have seven dental chairs, and we hired us on staff two doctors from our first graduating class. And last year, our clinic was certified by the Ministry of Health to serve as a training site for our students, albeit limited given the size. Every year, as was explained in the video, we sponsor four to five open houses where consultations and prescribed medicines are given freely to the community members who come. And we receive between 500 and 700 people on that very long day that we have these events. UNIFA students are required to participate in these mobile clinics and they do assist the doctors. The clinic was our first step in not only providing healthcare to our immediate community, but developing this clinical training for our students. In 2018, we took the next step and the UNIFA board decided to create a fund to begin construction on our own teaching hospital. We commissioned an architect to begin working on a plan. Now, I want to just generally describe the health and the sanitary conditions in Haiti without giving you a long litany of facts and figures, but just so that you can see the context. According to the most reliable statistics from a 2016-2018 study, there are 1,007 healthcare facilities in Haiti for a population that is upwards of 12 million. But healthcare facility is a broad and generously used term ranging from a small handful of fully equipped hospitals to bare dispensaries that are no more than a bed and some antiquated material. And very often, the only health professional that is there for miles is either a nurse or the new med student who graduated and is stationed there for a year. In this same 2016-2018 study, the facilities are categorized by the availability of such basic resources like steady source of electricity, bathrooms for patients, access to water and oxygen. Only 32% of health facilities in Haiti provide essential medicines and only 31 possess, possess basic medical equipment. Roughly 40% of Haiti's population lacks access to essential health and nutrition services. And roughly 60% of births are, are, occur outside a health facility or without a skilled provider. The State University Hospital is the largest teaching and treating hospital in the country, and it was severely damaged by the 2010 earthquake. But even before then, patients at the State Hospital were expected to provide material as basic as alcohol, gauze, IV solutions, syringes that were all part of their care. In 2004, before the coup, under the administration of my husband, uh, the, the Aristide administration, the government's allocation for health was 16.6%. Today, it's less than 5%. The COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, worsened the situation. There are hospital and health facilities that categorically refuse to accept anyone who exhibit any symptoms associated with the virus. In other facilities, the healthcare staff, especially in the beginning, was simply not showing up. They don't have the protective equipment and don't have medications to treat. In one hospital, patients got up from their beds and left the facility when they discovered that there were COVID-19 patients in the hospital. 
It's unfortunate, but this stigmatization is like this is widespread, as it was in the 1980s when Haitians were labeled the fourth H in the HIV AIDS pandemic then emerging alongside homosexuals, heroin users, and hemophiliacs. In fact, just this past June, under pressure, Netflix was forced to pull an episode from a documentary because they put Haiti at the center of the AIDS epidemic. To now ask an average Haitian to stay at home because of the pandemic condemns her to spend a day without food because the informal economy is the official economy. There's no social safety net. There's no government check in the mail. People question money spent on giant billboards and flyers and TV commercials about social distancing and hand washing when less than half of Haitians in rural areas have access to water. How do you social distance when motorcycle taxis are transporting up to three passengers at a time? When open markets are most corners where there is a little space? People with symptoms of COVID are asked to not only stay at home, but to stay confined to a separate room and use a separate bathroom. But what homes, what bathrooms, what bedrooms? Only 24% of Haitians have access to a modern toilet. There are people living in the bidonvilles, the favelas, who sleep on a rotating basis. Since the start of the pandemic, there has been little confidence in the daily posting of the numbers of COVID-19 cases and deaths you still have to know someone who maybe knows someone to get tested. So at the first sign of a fever, most Haitians resort to what they know best and what they've been doing all their lives, mixing a combination of herbal teas and relying on natural remedies. Two weeks ago, at the height of a gas shortage, which is still gripping the country, if you called the Ministry of Health to get a COVID test, you were asked to provide transportation for the testers because the ministry had run out of gas. Ultimately, one of the physicians who sits on the official government commission said that COVID-19 is so prevalent in Port-au-Prince, uh, which is the capital, that you don't have to test anymore. All patients presenting COVID-19 patients have about an 80% probability of being positive. But let's go back to UNIFA and our vision for the hospital. In the spring of 2009, as uh, Maxine was alluding to, we started construction in earnest on four acres of our 33 acre campus. And when she, Maxine, Danny, Walter Riley, Brian Concanon visited that April, they were able to tour the site. The architect in collaboration with the Dean of Medical School, who is a former Minister of Health, designed a three story facility of approximately 53,800 square feet with 50 beds and plenty of space to grow. There will be an emergency room, an on-site laboratory, pharmacy, and outpatient clinics in OBGYN, internal medicine, pediatrics, orthopedic surgery, urology, ophthalmology, and neurology. UNIFA's credo is education without exclusion. Our commitment is to excellence. If truly we want to train the best doctors, nurses, dentists, physical therapists, and other health professionals, we must do that at our own hospital under the supervision of our professors. The twin vocations of the university hospital, providing health care to the community and training health professionals is urgent. It cannot wait, and we are not waiting. Although classes were suspended in March and the campus is closed, construction on the hospital is moving forward. The foundation and all, all of the load-bearing walls of the entire ground level of the two wings is complete. The first of three reinforced concrete slab roofs have been poured. The second roof is scheduled to be poured within the next two weeks. A commission is right now reviewing the list of material and equipment that will be needed for a phased opening that can begin with four of the essential services for, on an, out care, on an out outpatient care basis. I want to end with what for me is a very hopeful story. On one of his trips to UNIFA, Dr. Henry Ford, who you will be hearing from in a little bit, who's uh, Dean of the Miami, School, uh, Miami Medical School, he came to UNIFA and lectured about a very complicated in utero procedure that he was able to perform when he was practicing at LA Children's Hospital. At the end of his lecture, a student thanked him for his inspiring talk. And the student said, you know, Dr. Ford, 
everything you showed us today was great. Clearly you work at a hospital with resources to help you save lives. However, you know the situation of the healthcare system in Haiti. We don't have an LA Children's Hospital. And then he went on to say, Dr. Ford, tell us what do we have to do? Who do we have to be as doctors in order to give our patients in Haiti that same level of care and save lives? Our students and their families make enormous sacrifices and overcome huge obstacles to pursue their university studies. They are committed to being the kind of healthcare professionals who will treat all people with no distinction. We are duty bound to ensure that this philosophy is at the core of all of their training, especially at the clinical level. When my husband, President Aristide, became Haiti's first democratically elected president back in 1991, his rallying call was Tout Moun Se Moun. Every person is a human being. Poor lives matter, black lives matter. His vision sounded simple, but was hugely profound. It was to move the country from misery to poverty with dignity. This vision continues to guide us. By educating the daughters and sons of domestic workers, subsistence farmers, market women, factory workers, teachers, street vendors, taxi drivers, Mun under yo, the historically excluded. Haiti is affirming this truth and is fully engaged in the struggle for dignity for all. I thank you for your time and for your attention. Thank you so much, Mildred. That was amazing. Um, wow, a whole lot of things I didn't know that are happening on the campus at UNIFA. Um, I am more excited than ever. And now is the moment that I want to invite you to all to join us in this uh, in this vision and to complete this work to get to finish building the hospital and to equip it. Um, we need resources to do that work. Um, the human resources, as you've heard, are there. The people are there. The students are there. Their families are supporting them. Some of them are being supported by a relative who's driving a cab in New York City. You know, who's sending their nephew to school in Haiti to serve, um, to serve their country. I think we owe it to them to, to stand in here um, and provide the resources to get the university built. Um, herf has been supporting UNIFA since 2011, um, but specifically around building the hospital and in the lead up to this call, Herf has raised uh, $60,000 in pledges from supporters around the country. And our goal, so we've already raised 60,000, and our goal today via this phone call is to raise an additional $60,000. Um, I think we can do it. I think we can double, we can double that first 60,000. We've had over 230 people on this call um, so far, and we're gonna share the video out even more broadly. I did some quick math while Mildred was talking, and if everybody was able to give 250, dollars, we would hit the 60,000 goal. I know that everybody on the call isn't able to make that kind of donation. We know these are very hard times here in the United States, that we're in the middle of a pandemic and massive loss of employment. So we're not trying to shame anyone. But what I want to ask is for each of you to consider making a donation that's meaningful to you, given where, wherever you are in your life and, and in your economic situation. So if it's a $10 donation, if it's a $25 donation, we would be thrilled to have it and to have you join with us. And if you're able to do more, we also want to open up the space and ask you to do that because really we got to give as we can. So if you're able to make a thousand dollar contribution, we would encourage you, we want to make space and welcome you into to do that now. Um, we are sharing, there's a, for those of you on the Zoom, if you click on the chat, there'll be, we're sharing a link where you can give. You can click through directly to, to, um, where, to the donation page of the Haiti Emergency Relief uh, website. And for those of you who are not on the Zoom, it's just www.haitiemergencyrelief.org. And then you click on the donate button. We are raising these, Haiti Emergency Relief is raising the funds here in the United States, but we are going, we, we send all the money to, to Haiti. Uh, Herf doesn't have any staff. We're all doing this on a volunteer basis. So there's no overhead here in the US. It's all going to Haiti. Um, so I want to encourage you to do that. Again, it's 
www.haitiemergencyrelief.org. And to go ahead and do it right now while we're all together on this call and see if we can hit our $60,000 goal. Um, I am lastly going to invite Danny to join me, if you're still on here, Danny, uh, in this call. To I'm still on. I'm still Wonderful. Throwing it back to Danny. You're throwing it back to me. Uh, I, thank you so much, uh, Mildred. Thank you so much, uh, everyone who's on here. Ira, Congresswoman um, Waters, just everyone. Um, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna start it off, okay? I'm donating five thousand dollars. I'm not asking everyone else to donate. Donate what you can. Um, all I can do is it, all I can do in listening to the story, as, as the stories that we all have, the Congresswoman has, the stories that, that Ira has, and then and certainly the story that Mildred just laid out, is just think about, we need this. This, is, this belong to all of us. This hospital, this, this, this opportunity belongs to all of humanity. And, and certainly I, I want to, uh, in, in this particular point in time, yes, we have so many things to work on. Yes, in this country and in the world, we have so many things to work on. But each time we put our resources and our human energy into talking about the right of dignity, humanity, the right of health care, the right of, of people living lives that they're proud of and that they're, 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 it, it's, you know, that they're part of, I just think that we have to do that. I'm so moved by this hospital and, all, and how we can replicate this. And this example gives us examples that we can export and find around the region and around the world. Thank you so much. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I was muted. Um, great. Thank you so much, Danny. So we're going to continue to ask you to give over the next, uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so minutes while our other speakers are talking. We'll come back and um, give you a little more information on that again. But right now, I want to go to Dr. Henri Ford, who is the Dean and Chief Academic Officer at the University of Miami, Leonard M. Miller School of Medicine. He's a Haitian-born pediatric surgeon. And Dr. Ford returns regularly to Haiti to provide medical care. And as you've heard, he's also lectured at UNIFA and so knows well the situation on the ground and also UNIFA's, the role that UNIFA can play. So we just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more, Dr. Ford, about um, the situation, the healthcare situation in Haiti and, and how you, you know, what role you feel that UNIFA's teaching hospital can play. Thank you so much, Laura, for the opportunity to speak uh, and to be part of this really outstanding panel. Um, I, I'm truly humbled to be in such an amazing company. Mildred, all I can say is, wow, double wow. What an inspiring delivery. Um, you know, you really put together uh, the picture in such a way that uh, no one else can. And with a certain eloquence and, and then really empathy because you're living it. And you really, you know, even as one who goes back and forth to Haiti all the time, you, you made it real. So thank you so very much. I'm deeply moved. In fact, I, I decided to dispense with my prepared remarks uh, because uh, you inspired me so much. Um, and I'm gonna be relatively brief. I was born in Haiti. Uh, I left my country uh, just before I turned 14 and, and then grew up in Brooklyn and you know, New Jersey for college and then Boston, med school, back to New York and, and eventually ended up uh, uh, in Los Angeles, where I was when the Haiti earthquake uh, hit. And this is, uh, even though I had been going back and forth on some mission work in Haiti, I recognized at that time that Haiti didn't need my money uh, only, which always needs the money, uh, but they also needed uh, my skills, my talent as a pediatric surgeon. I was the chief of surgery at Children's in LA at the time. And after, and, and, and I flew shortly after the earthquake uh, to Port-au-Prince and as part of the um, 
uh, the team that was deployed by the Department of Health and Human Services, the DMAT intra team. I can say that after spending two of the most grueling weeks of my life uh, trying to help save lives, trying to help alleviate some of the suffering of the Haitian people who had uh, been victimized by this devastating earthquake, uh, I recognize that um, this is not one of those situations where you could say it's one and done. Haiti was suffering from a profound lack of a, a healthcare infrastructure, which is why we saw so many deaths. Uh, and in addition to that, <clears throat> there were so many people who were uh, badly um, injured and, 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 and critically wounded in such a way that uh, they, uh, they had more amputees than anyone could ever envision. Um, hence the need to have a physical therapy school. Um, so after that particular engagement, it became clear to me that I needed to continue to go back to help show up that healthcare infrastructure. So I started to go back to Haiti to work uh, with some of the medical students, with some of the deans to reform the or revamp the, uh, the medical school curriculum and also to teach some of the uh, Haitian uh, uh, surgery residents and, 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 and practicing surgeons how to take care of neonatal surgical emergencies because a lot of babies were really dying unnecessarily of uh, very pedestrian problems that uh, in any other um, developed country uh, they they are managed they manage uh, to find um, a cure for uh, so having said that uh, that was <clears throat> that has been the engagement and, and it was um, shortly after they returned to Haiti that I had the privilege of meeting with uh, uh, Mildred and uh, former president of IST. And, and there I heard their bold vision to create this educational ecosystem, a model very much after the best uh, North, North American universities uh, in UNIFA. This was the transform, really the transformational idea that they had. And, 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 and I must say, I, I, I had some skepticism that you could pull this up, but but, but if anybody can do it, it's really uh, Mildred uh, and, and, and the former president. Uh, they are relentless, they are resilient, and, and they have a vision to transform the country into and recognizing that it's education. It's about equipping the, uh, the Haitian people with the right tools, education and some kind of vocational skill that's going to get us out of, uh, of the conditions that we find ourselves in. Um, which is why I have continued to, to support UNIFI in so many ways. Uh, you know, after we separated conjoint twins in Haiti for the very first time, the only the place where uh, I, we gave the more or less press conference and the first academic conference was at UNIFI because uh, it was important for uh, these students uh, to understand what is possible because I am just like all of them. We have a, t a number of exceptionally talented, bright students at UNIFA who ask the most provocative questions. And, and you can see the thirst for knowledge, the thirst for un hun you know, the, the hunger for, uh, for access uh, to the best technology, for them to be able to become um, the best physicians and the best healthcare professionals that they can be. And, and, and this has been truly very moving. You know? So Haiti needs more doctors. And in order for us to have more doctors, um, we need to have a medical school. But in order for us to, for these medical students to actually train and for these residents to ever ultimately become practicing physicians, we need hospitals. And here comes the, the, the argument for why we need to have a teaching hospital uh, affiliated with the medical school. There is no question that it is of a paramount importance. We just don't have enough hospital beds in the country. And this is a unique opportunity for us to not only um, undergird the amazing work that's taking place at UNIFA, uh, but also to provide the students, uh, the medical students and, and residents, uh, an opportunity to train uh, in a state-of-the-art you know, hospital uh, so that uh, they can uh, meet, help meet the needs uh, of the country in not only providing care now, but also in the future. So um, uh, to me, the success of this ecosystem that's uh, being built, that, or that they have already built, um, depends largely on completing the next step, which is to erect that 
teaching hospital. So I couldn't be more supportive, more excited about it, more eager uh, to actually uh, you know, do all we can to ensure its success, both in my capacity as a dean of the uh, University of Miami Middle School of Medicine, but also as a native Haitian. Uh, and also inspired by uh, Danny Glover's uh, um, uh, very generous gesture, although I'm not quite in his league as an academic uh, uh, physician, uh, I will, I am pledging $1,000. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. That's great. All right. Well, I know we've already raised $6,000 for sure. So that puts us one tenth of the way there. We still have 15 minutes and I want to really encourage y'all to click on that link. Go ahead and do your donation now because you may forget after you get off the phone. Best time to do it is now. We're also going to pull up a mailing address for folks who might want to send checks. Um, if, you know, if you don't want to give online, we'll, we'll get that into the chat in a minute as well. Um, and we'll follow up the call. We'll provide all that information and a follow up from the call as well, like via email. Um, Please allow me to yeah. join with uh, Danny Glover uh, in making uh, a contribution. We're in the middle of our campaign, uh, but I do have a, um, a committee that is called the Leadership Committee uh, that um, you know, I get contributions into. Uh, that can be utilized uh, for nonprofits, et cetera. And so I believe that I will be able and will follow through and absolutely commit to the same amount that Danny did, $5,000 from People Helping People Political Action Committee uh, to go toward this wonderful mission of this teaching hospital. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you, Congresswoman Waters. That's amazing. Um, you know, I'm also going to donate $1,000. I just wanted to say that. So I think we're well on our way to our goals here. And um, I wanted to remind people that sometimes if you, you can get a um, match, this, we are a 501, Haiti, Haiti Emergency Relief Fund is a 501c3 foundation in the United States. So your donations are tax deductible. And if you um, have a program at your work, you can sometimes get a match for your giving. So you might wanna look into that as well. A lot of workplaces have that. So this would be a great opportunity to double your own gift um, to HERF. Okay, we are going to go to our next speaker. Um, we, this call spans, this work is generational and this call spans the generations. We wanted to have people who've been at this work for decades, um, some of us are, you know, we're young when we started and not so young now. Um, but we also have young people who are emerging to fill, um, to fill our faces. Um, so I want to introduce Kayrana Harmon, who's a Ujima scholar and president of the Black Student Union at Foothill College. And she's a member of Students for Haiti Solidarity. And Kayrana, I know you recently were in Haiti and had the chance to visit the UNIFA campus. And I thought you could tell us a little bit about those experiences. And I'm particularly interested from your point of view to hear your perspective on the connections you see between the movement for black lives in the United States and the struggle for dignity in Haiti. So turn it to Corona. Okay, I think the audio is better now. <laughs> I'm on here uh, twice, so it was echoing. But um, first I just wanna say, uh, and bonsoir. Hello and give thanks. Um, it's definitely uh, an honor <laughs> to just be in this space. Uh, thank you to my mentor Seth, uh, Robert, this is Aristide, Pierre, just all my mentors and everyone, you know, their presence here, listening, just being able to bring yourself in this space. Um, it's, it's definitely a blessing not to look over. So uh, I'm very thankful to be here. And yes, uh, my name is Kayrana Harmon. Um, I'm in, I grew up out of um, all over the Bay Area in California. Um, I just turned 20 years old uh, about two weeks ago. So yes, I'm a, a, a younger voice. <laughs> and I'm actually the former uh, BSU president from my, uh, my high school and Foothill College. And um, I've been uh, taking notes as everyone's uh, talking, uh, always in student mode. <laughs> uh, we're never done learning. So um, just thank you for everyone sharing. Um, 
I think just, uh, you know, just to keep it brief, uh, the connection between um, the struggles in Haiti and then Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S., let alone the Bay Area, California. Um, I just want people to realize that um, it's all the same, just the coverage is different. Um, that we really, we truly are, I believe in my heart, and that, you know, we are all one, more similar than different. And, you know, with the spirit of um, Ubuntu, I am because we are, you know, Haiti's struggles are our struggles. Uh, we can't forget them. They're humans just like us. They're just, you know, on a different island, a different, you know, location, a different city, whatever it is that, you know, I am here because of, you know, their resilience, their strength for Black liberation and constantly, you know, learning and uh, researching from them. Um, just how um, I can find my role and that, you know, I encourage everyone to, you know, find their role um, that it may not be, um, whether that's protests, uh, donating, um, studying, you know, to be nurses, uh, agriculture, um, uh, finance, healthcare, government, education, that, you know, you have your strength, your talent, your voice, your presence, um, and that's that's useful and that's powerful wherever you can use it. Um, but yeah, just the what it means to me, um, being able to, I was 17 at the time, um, going to first time to Haiti uh, with my group from my high school, um, visited multiple, um, uh, yes, the University of UNIFA, um, I got to meet Ms. Aristide, yes, and just the blessing of her, um, her network and just lots of powerful leaders and stories that, you know, a lot of people I wasn't even exposed to and, you know, in this growing up and getting educated in the Silicon Valley, um, not even hearing the word Haiti, let alone uh, being able to have the privilege to go to Haiti and hear the stories and bring them back here and just the messages because the stories matter and the truth matters. And that's what, that's what's really important. That's what's really important to me. Um, so I guess just lastly, I want to just, uh, I, the ending, uh, no, I always just want to give, uh, bring with me in this space is, uh, you know, to have faith, you know, uh, to smile more, to have courage and, you know, empowerment through our, our conversations and our actions towards healing, fixing wrongs, learning, um, and just, you know, always learning, being open uh, with the spirits and the practices of Sankofa, you know, giving back uh, what's been given to you, um, Emoja or Unity, if you don't know what Emoja stands for, and definitely um, Dignity, so. Thank you so much, Kairona. Um, feeling like we have a bright future, both here in the United States and in Haiti. Um, so I'm hearing we have $28,000 pledged so far between the, the pledges that folks have been making here and the donations are pouring in on the website. So let's keep that going. Um, I just shared the mailing address in the chat and we'll follow up with an email with that as well. But you can also just go ahead and give right now to HaitiEmergencyRelief.org. Um, and now I'm going to turn to our final speaker tonight, today, not tonight, today, um, Ira Kurzban who's gonna bring it home for us. Um, Ira is a civil rights and immigration attorney who spent decades fighting for the rights of immigrants and refugees. He was the counsel for the government of Haiti from 1991 to 2004, some very tumultuous years. Um, and also an old friend of mine, comrade in this struggle of many Haiti triumphs and tribulations. Um, so our question for you, Ira, is you've worked with the Aristides for over 30 years. Uh, much of that work has focused on guaranteeing basic human rights, whether it was through government, through education, through healthcare. Um, and I'm wondering how you see the work of UNIFA around both education and healthcare in that long arc of the struggle for human rights in Haiti. Thank you, Laura. Um, let me begin uh, first by saying what an honor it is to uh, be with all the people on this panel. Uh, to uh, Kirona Harmon for um, showing us what the next generation of people will be like after we're long gone. We can feel confident that we will have someone like her and others fighting for justice 
uh, fighting uh, in solidarity with the people of Haiti. So thank you, Kayrona. Thank you also to Dr. Ford, who to me has always been uh, the uh, exemplar of the kind of people in the, uh, the diaspora who have gone back to Haiti, who have worked for uh, Haiti, who believe in the future of Haiti, uh, and who have been there not only as a teacher, but as an example for all of the uh, students who rely on uh, a future in Haiti as doctors. So thank you very much. And of course, Laura, thank you. Laura is, I always feel Laura is kind of like my sister. I've known Laura for uh, over 30 years. Uh, she has always been there in the struggles. She has always been optimistic. She's always been fighting uh, for dignity for the Haitian people. And um, this is just another example of her good work. Uh, and thanks, of course, to Mildred. Uh, who I have known, uh, many of you may not know this, but I've known Mildred so long that I actually, along with Vice President Biden, spoke at Mildred's graduation when she was a law student. And um, Mildred, um, you know, as a lawyer, uh, I think initially, like all of us, came to Haiti with the idea of looking at uh, human rights as legal rights. And I think uh, as she's demonstrated today, um, that understanding grew more and more into a, a, an understanding that legal rights are just a very narrow part of what human rights are uh, for the dignity uh, and justice for Haitians that they deserve. And then, of course, to Danny Glover, you know, we all know Danny's a, an incredibly famous actor, but I actually, I remember Danny uh, in the early 1980s when he was good enough and kind enough to come to Miami uh, and meet at the Haitian Refugee Center when, you know, no one was talking about Haitian refugees very much in those days. Uh, he has always been an inspiration to me because he has not only shown great intelligence, commitment, historical knowledge about Haiti and about the other countries in the Western Hemisphere, but he's really been there. Uh, and every single way throughout the last 30 years in terms of helping Haiti and other people in the Western Hemisphere. So thank you very much, uh, Danny, uh, and thanks for your commitment all these years. And of course, last but not least, is Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who I have to tell you, uh, I owe an incredible debt to because she's actually saved my life twice, not once. Well, once in Haiti and then once in the Central African Republic. It's a very long story, but uh, I always say about Congresswoman Waters, if we had 10 of her in Congress, America would look like a totally different uh, country. She has the courage, commitment, intelligence, uh, and that fighting spirit that we unfortunately don't always see in our Congress. So I love you, thank you for everything you've done. And uh, in the honor of all the people today, I'm also going to make a contribution of $5,000 uh, toward uh, the teaching hospital. Uh, I've spent virtually my entire legal career fighting for justice and dignity for Haitian refugees in the United States and the people of Haiti. And I was privileged to work with the democratically elected governments of Haiti from 1991 the 2004 most privileged, of course, to work with President Jean Bertrand Aristide. You know, I understood from the very beginning of my work with Haitian refugees and then with the people of Haiti that human rights and political and legal rights are intertwined. We cannot have a fair and just legal or political system unless we have healthy, educated citizens. After all, how can we teach people about the rule of law who are too sick to go to school, too weak from illness to vote, too worried about finding clean water to support democracy? Health is a human right, and without it, all the other political and social and legal rights can never be fully effectuated. In the years we spent to end impunity for wrongdoing in Haiti, we found that the Haitian people courageously 
and without hesitation sought justice. But justice comes in many forms. Justice is the right to live without violence, to educate your children whether or not you are wealthy, to drink clean water, to have a roof over your head, and to have access to health care. I stand with the Aristides in their struggle over the last 30 years to achieve that kind of justice uh, for Haiti and for the Haitian people. You know, when President Aristide returned to Haiti in 2011, he made a promise to the Haitian people that he would dedicate his life to education, to the rule of law, and to the health of its citizens. And every day he has sought to fulfill that promise. But no person can accomplish this goal alone. The health of the Haitian people is more precarious than ever. Haiti, you know, has endured earthquakes, cholera, hurricanes, and now the coronavirus. We also know that the more population is vulnerable to general ill health, the easier the coronavirus can spread. And we, unfortunately, in the U.S. have not helped Haiti. In fact, unfortunately, the opposite is true. By knowingly and intentionally deporting Haitians to Haiti that have contracted COVID-19, we have harmed the people of Haiti. Instead of treating Haitians in the U.S. with COVID-19, we've deported them and thus helped to spread the virus in the most vulnerable place in this hemisphere. We owe the Haitian people at least the ability to take care of themselves, to train doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals in Haiti to help the country. That's why I personally donated a lot of money prior today, and I will personally donate again $5,000 to the UNIFA Teaching Hospital. We all need to do our parts, and we hope that you all will help as well. So dig deep as much as you can into your pockets in these tough times and give some money to people to allow them to help themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ira. Um, that's hard to hear about the United States actively spreading COVID to Haiti. It's devastating. It's unfortunately not inconsistent with the history of the United States relationship with Haiti. So we all owe a big debt to Haiti. Um, I'm gonna encourage you one last time to make a donation if you haven't already. We are at over um, 40,000. We have an additional uh, anonymous donation of 5,000 that someone reached out to let us know about. And we've raised 35,000 online and through all the speakers. So that's pretty amazing. I think we're gonna hit the 60,000 by the end of the day. I'm always optimistic, yes. And go ahead and give now. And then we're also going to bug you later. We're going to follow up with an email with all the information on where to give. And also, if you maybe have more questions, um, we'll figure out a way to uh, answer those questions for you. Um, I'm going to wind it up because we want to respect your time. We're on time, which is pretty amazing. We're very close to on time. Um, we know you're all busy. Thank you for spending a chunk of your Saturday with us. I want to thank all of our sponsors who, who joined us in this call. Special thanks to the tech people, especially Karina Nolette from Global Exchange and Lauren Richardson who ran the back end of this call and to Nia Amara for creating the beautiful invitation, to Lisa Roth for her design work. Shout out to Boots Riley and, and Danny Glover again for helping to promote the webinar with their social media followings, it's been great. Um, thanks to Michelle Carson for use of her video Haiti Action Committee for all their work, Margaret Prescott of Global Women's Strike, and then finally to our panelists, Danny, Mildred, Kayrana, Ari Ford, Ira Kurzban for sharing all your time and wisdom with us today. Um, I encourage you again to give generously, as generously as you can to support this incredible work in Haiti, and we will follow up. Let's get this hospital built. Let's complete this campaign for dignity, and let's train a new generation of doctors and other health workers in Haiti. Thank you all for being here. We are going to sign off. But maybe we can all just unmute and say goodbye. How about that? Let's do that. Can you unmute yourselves? I don't know. If you can't, just wave. <laughs> bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, bye. bye bye. All right, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Bye. Later. Goodbye. All right, Jen. I hear it. Okay. <laughs>
Et la tout l'univers, c'est 